Good evening, everyone. I call the Monday, July 15th City Council meeting to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Santee? Here. Alderman Glab? Here. Alderman Schaefer? Here. Alderwoman Bainey? Here. Alderman Mehevic? Here. Alderman Devine? Here. Alderwoman Miller? Here. Mayor Jett? Here. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda is uh, public comment. I have two on the list here. Tony Esposito, if you want to take, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Rand. <coughs> I want to company Pedal and Poor. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't get delivery of the pedal boats that we had ordered 18 months ago. Uh, we we're not giving up on that concept, but we didn't want to disappoint the city with your cooperation to make uh, the city an attraction and create an experience on the water. So we're going to uh, hopefully uh, get your approval to do something which we think will be very popular. It's called a donut boat. These boats are usually, I'll just pass this around, these boats are usually just rent it out to the public without any kind of license at all. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna drive the boat as a master captain. So there's gonna be no issue about safety. We're gonna follow all the requirements that we have in the license about insurance and everything else, and registration and all the safety features. It's just gonna be a different boat than the pedal boat because we can't, we just didn't deliver. The Trident Company delivered only two of the four boats that we had ordered. We do have a pedal boat in our fleet right now and it is a, um, uh, it's a, it runs on solar power. And the problem is if it doesn't get under the pedestrian bridge, it not only does damage to the frame, it'll do damage to the solar panels. And without Miller Point being quite ready, it just isn't a viable option to do the pedal boat. But we're not giving up on it for this season, but we think that this is gonna be great. It's gonna be parked by the pier at Buddy's Ease, where both the patios are at. It's gonna get you know exposure from the street, and, we, and we're gonna be able to charge a much more affordable rate. So we think this is gonna be a good option. Do you know how, much, how many people that holds? This is a nine passenger. Is that less than what we said? Yes, the yes, it's a small. And they're, they're really safe. People rent them out all the time with just a driver's license. So to have a captain drive it and have all the, the safety features are really going above and beyond. But we, we didn't wanna you know, go into the rentable business. That's not what we agreed to do. We wanna make a safe, fun experience for everybody. And again, I very much apologize, but it really wasn't our doing if the company didn't deliver it on two of the four boats that we had in order. 
Is that okay? Yep. Thanks, Tony. Okay. All right. Okay. Does anyone have any we questions as far as council? Any questions? We're good. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, this, yeah, this is really plan. informal. So we have an agreement, and the agreement, he's going to follow everything else in the agreement except the type of boat. The type of boat. And this I is mean, a, we don't know what the boat was anyway. Right? I just wrote the word down that he gave us. We saw a picture of it. It was nice and everything. I think the key is that it's not a bigger boat. Uh, it looks smaller, actually. And, it's a smaller uh, boat. And, and it's not, people aren't going to hurt themselves because they're not pedaling. No, <laughs> they're not. Well. <laughs> yeah, but the novelty about the pedal boat is really something that we will capitalize yeah. up here. We right. will bring one up here. But uh, we didn't want to waste the summer and, and the opportunity that you gave us. So we want to make the most of it. So we, our choices are few. You can nod your head and he'll just do it. And uh, if you want, I'll bring back an agreement that has, you know, a couple of simple edits to it. And we'll ratify it at the next meeting, or we can just not do anything and just let him do it, or say no, and he won't do it. Or, or, or you know, we can put it on the next agenda, but he's, you know, obviously we're in the middle of summer here. I wanted to get it. This, I boat know, is, I know. this boat will be ready. I wanted to get something for the fest. I was very disappointed that we couldn't get the pedal boat in, you know, two weeks ago and have right. it be kind of marketed sure, for the fest. And now we're going to have everything, all the activity has a green street this coming week and the parade and. You know, and you have those. access to one of those? No. It, yes. Yeah, it's going to be here tomorrow. So it's, <laughs> yeah, I've really tried very hard to, to make Typical this happen. Summer stuff. I mean, these boats, like I said, are very safe. They rent them out to the general public. So if I'm operating the boat and I have a license better. and we have passengers on there, I can assure you that everything is going to be safe. This is going to be in the no-wake zone unless it's a really, really calm and I make a decision it's safe to go outside the no-wake. We're going to stay in the no-wake zone. It's about a two mile an hour boat is what it is. But it's fun, it has a table in the middle, people converse and have a cocktail. And it's gonna have nav navigation lights so we can go out at dusk. Okay. Um, Perfect, thank you, Tom. Okay. Bobby, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah I was gonna ask what's it gonna take to get it in the water by Saturday? <laughs> uh, we're gonna <laughs> I mean, we're, no, we're shoot for Thursday. For Thursday. The boat is being delivered to Dees Marine uh, tomorrow. And there's a few preparation items that we have to do. We're gonna do some trial runs, hopefully Wednesday, and then uh, Thursday, Friday, start, you know, getting passengers. And legally, what do we have to do to have it running? In? I well, mean, is there anything we have to? Um, we have to amend the agreement, theoretically, if you're interested. It's, it really, that, that part of the agreement of what kind of boat he has is really not the issue. We didn't want a speedboat, but we didn't want, I don't know what we didn't want, but. What we're getting and compared to this is, seems to be a wash. It's just a change of name. But I can change the name and give it back to you at the next meeting. If you, like I said, if you want him to do it right now, just say we're good with it and he'll do it. We'll ratify it at the next meeting. But we're just looking for a direction from the council, I guess. I'd be in favor of that. Okay. I'm going to Yeah, I don't like uh, proving things after the fact, to be honest with you. But uh, in this case, I don't think anything was specific about the boats in the motion or anything else. It was just basically no, the, no. the concept more than anything else that was approved. Right, but the agreement's specific. For a pedal boat. Yeah, we gave him what he wanted. And then if, he, if he would have said the pedal boat or this boat, I'm sure we would have said fine. So as long as his uh, captain takes some pedals as The important thing, he's going to be in the boat. That's <laughs> the this is a, it's a motorized vessel. And it, it's usually rented out in, in communities to anybody for the mm -hmm. family and the driver's license. Yeah. So to have a, a master captain operate it is, is going to be more than a safe type of experience for anybody that is aboard. If we need to bring it back to council the next meeting, I don't have a problem. It's a technical thing more than anything else. The concept is still there of what is being offered. It is. Sure. Alderman Schaefer? So it's a guest plus you, right? Yes, it's going to be guests. Eight, eight, eight plus the captain, plus or nine plus the captain? It's nine passengers total, so it was like eight. Uh, eight plus you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Everyone yes. okay with bringing this back? Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward. Hold okay. Get them all right. Thursday. Thank, Thank you. Okay, good luck. We would be able to operate them this week? Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. I okay. appreciate it. Tony, I appreciate you. Yeah. yeah, okay. Coming forward. Thanks Thank you so much, everybody. Thank okay. you. Thank you.
Next person, Scott. Are you? We'll in? just wait till after the talk from the chief. And we'll go okay. Everything. I don't know. <laughs> you're not going to. Well, you're not going to change right. the um, right. restrictions. Okay. I'm assuming. Okay. All right. Any other uh, members of the public that would like to make a public comment at this time? No. All right, moving on uh, to the consent agenda, uh, items 5A through 5O. Is there any uh, council members wanting to, uh, wanting to pull any items for separate consideration? See none. Uh, look for a motion to approve 5A through 5O. Alderman Santi? I will make the motion to approve the consent agenda 5A through 5-0 as presented. Thank you. Second. Alderman Schaefer. Second. Discussion on these items? Uh, just a, if you would, a brief explanation on 5-D. As, uh, as far as um, just the overall? Yeah, overall because it, it, it is a little bit unique because of what we did in regards to kind of moving some things around and, and, and getting some more streets on the um, uh, on the uh, contract for this year? Yes, so when we scoped out the road program uh, before the start of the fiscal year, we were directed to do some estimating for uh, Chickaloon, but also a number of alternates. So this is unorthodox in that our alternates are actually a bigger part of our program than, than the base bid. And then there was some consideration of, of awarding all alternates depending on how favorable the bids came in. One thing that happened with another project that had hit the, uh, the capital improvement program was originally budgeted for, I believe, 350000 out of general fund was the home ramble improvements. Um, preliminary engineering came in uh, and combined between construct <coughs> estimated construction costs and construction engineering, we're, we're pushing $700,000. We can't fund that whole project this year and need to reevaluate our approach. So with that, that money being freed up, we have elected to fund the entire road program and all alternates, which is something I, I believe council had some interest in anyways um, prior to this news coming in about home ramble. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Santee? Yes. Alderman Schaefer? Yes. Alderman Glad? Yes. Alderwoman Bainey? Yes. Alderman Mahevic? Yes. Alderman Devine? Yes. Alderwoman Miller? Yes. Thank you, Council. Next item on the agenda is 6A. Uh, is a discussion to adopt an ordinance amending the fiscal year 1920 budget, fund 450 capital equipment in the amount of $28,850 and authorization to purchase one pickup truck as quoted from Gary Lang Auto Group in the amount of $28,850 as a replacement vehicle for the Parks Maintenance Division. Bill, can you please present this item? Yeah, this is pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, we had a truck that we've had just ongoing maintenance with uh, over the last six years. You can see pretty quickly what those amounts add up to. And the engine blew on that truck. And so if we move forward with uh, replacement of the engine on that vehicle, we already have exceeded the cost of a brand new vehicle um, from what, we've, what we would have spent over the last six years. Um, so with that, we went and got three quotes from our three local dealerships and that present that to you uh, for a replacement for that truck. Any uh, questions or comments regarding this item? Other I just maybe? have a question about the agreement we have with Leopardo. It, did that truck not fit into replacement vehicles, having them manage? It, it would have been in that agreement for sure. It was like one or two right there um, with the amount of miles, the years that it had on it, and the maintenance costs over the years. Uh, we have one other truck that's probably neck and neck with that one. This one has just happened to have the engine blow on before we are ready to proceed with that lease. Okay, I was, just, I was just curious how that how it was working. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Santi. Yeah, I, I, I see the need for this. I, I, I really am very uncomfortable with budget amendments, just because it's taken money that we did not budget. Uh, my concern is, is that yeah, it's been I mean, it's been an ongoing problem for six years. Was there any chance to look at this two years ago, three years ago? Was to to make a change or possibly you know get a different? It's vehicle one of those vehicles that's been presented. It has you know on a, on a continual basis uh, to put in for replacement, and you know that's that's what we run into a little. We're just trying to patch things up and keep things moving the best we can. Yeah. Unfortunately, I just think, I feel like at this point, and this was my discussion with with uh, City Administrator Moorfield, was that I think we've exceeded that. Like, it doesn't make any sense to put this much more money into this truck 
and know that we've already had this, these ongoing maintenance problems with it, as yeah. well as some of the body issues with this truck. <coughs> and nothing, I, I, I think different, different departments have different fleets. There, there's, there's nothing available that would, would, I hate to say it this way, band-aid it. We, we have, no. uh, we've robbed about every vehicle that we can, including the, the, the city hall truck, to try to, to make that work. Uh, but everybody is you know, short on vehicles. We, we cart kids, or our summer help kids, we cart them around in our silver uh, Taurus, our office vehicle, uh -huh. um, to get them out to like Peterson Park to be able to do work. So we're doing the best we can to make it work with what we have. And we'll be able, like th this, will, this vehicle will be doing some, will it be doing some following in the yes. winter? Currently we could not utilize this vehicle because of the shape it was in for plowing, uh -huh. but the new, the replacement vehicle is one that we would utilize for plowing. We'll take all the money to outfit that with the plow out of our small equipment budget so that we can minimize the impact of the uh, requested budget amendment. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Is there anyone from the public that would like to make a public comment regarding this item? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion uh, for 6A as presented. Alderman Schaefer? I'll make that motion. Second. Alderman Bainey? Uh, discussion? <coughs> See none. Clerk, please call roll. Alderman Schaefer? Yes. Alderwoman Bainey? Yes. Alderwoman Miller? Yes. Alderman Devine? Yes. Alderman Mehevic? Yes. Alderman Glad? Yes. Alderman Santee? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council. Next item on the agenda is 6B, discussion to approve a text amendment to the McHenry Zoning Ordinance related to Patriot Estates. Doug, can you please present this item? Thank you, Mayor Jett. <laughs> Due to an error in the city's zoning map several years ago, the Patriot Estates duplex neighborhood was planned to be built with an incorrect setback, R RS3, instead of the correct RM2 setback. Kunat Development, the builder, designed a home product which did not meet the side yard setback, and when the error was discovered, some lots were already built and incorrect setbacks were not caught, and other unimproved lots need to accommodate the housing product and adjusted setback. This error only impacts the interior side yard setback, however, I did put at your places uh, an, an ordinance and uh, minutes. Uh, this went to planning and zoning last Wednesday. Um, and uh, the ordinance correctly uh, states that no setback shall be less than seven feet and uh, between seven and 15 feet for the duplex neighborhood of du uh, Patriot State Subdivision. I uh, recommend approval and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Doug. Uh, any questions, comments regarding this item? I'll move on. Yeah. With the reduction of these setbacks, uh, where are we as far as our site clearance at the intersections? Are we still going to have that, what is it, 45 degree uh, view? I, you know, this affects the whole neighborhood. I, I can't. I understand that, but we're only talking the corner, so I'm interested in right now. It, it, it doesn't affect the corner side yards. It won't. No. Uh, just the inner side yards. Just the interior point. side yards. Okay. Answer quick question. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Is there anyone from the public that would like to make a public comment regarding this item? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion to approve 6B as presented. Alderman Miller? So moved. Second by Alderman Santi. I will second the motion. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Alder Alderwoman Miller? Yes. Alderman Santi? Yes. Alderman Glad? Yes. Alderman Schaefer? Yes. Alderwoman Bainey? Yes. Alderman Mehevic? Yes. Alderman Devine? Yes. Thank you, Council. You two are uh, <laughs> good to go. Move in. <laughs> All right. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, 6C, discussion to approve a real estate abatement and incentive agreement with Jessup Manufacturing. Doug, can you please present this item? Thank you, Mayor Jett. Jessup Manufacturing uh, appeared before the City Council on May 20th of this year seeking a five-year tax abatement on all new taxes generated after their 35,000 square foot uh, addition was completed. The Council expressed interest in an abatement agreement. Attached is an abatement agreement for Council's consideration. Um, I can say I did I put an update in the supplement as to where the uh, we stand on the various taxing bodies and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Doug. Questions regarding this item? Alderman Santi? Okay. 
So it reads where the fire protection already passed it, and it's being considered by the other taxing bodies, correct? They, they have not officially passed it yet, or have they? Correct. The fire district has passed it. Uh, I believe District 156 is going to vote on it tonight. Okay. Um, I believe the library district is going to vote on it tomorrow night. It has gone to the library district uh, once already. It has gone to McHenry Township once already, and they'll yeah, they consider it the next month. Um, it has gone to the finance committee of the county board. At the township, they just tabled it, or what, they didn't uh, discuss it? They did discuss it. Um, they tabled it because they wanted their uh, attorney to look into a couple additional provisions in the clawback section of the agreement. Uh, for instance, that they have to stay at that location. I think it says now six months. They were saying more like a couple years, up, up, I think up to five years, provisions like that. So that's uh -huh. why they won't, they tabled it. All right, thank you. No for the questions. Any other questions, comments? Alderman Schaefer? And Jessup's not uh, interested in the recapturing anything in the future? We, we have, it's, it's been a, the stance that Jessup cannot recapture on the, the, the water main that's being extended. For any, any other of those businesses that are in between there and where we well, start the main? We, we covered that in those specific agreements. But that it, but I was saying it wasn't anything that they wanted to do. That was it their was. decision. We did whatever correct. they wanted to do. Whatever so they wanted to do. So it was their decision not to yeah. recapture. Well or to the extent they cut it they negotiated a deal independently of that agreement. Oh okay. they, they, they handled all those negotiations. Okay. Thank you. They didn't need any recapture through us. Any other questions? So Doug on the clawback provision what if the township changes the six months? Well, I hope that's not the case. And why would they do that? Well, it just came up. I, I don't know what's going to happen as far as that's concerned. I, I'll, I'll have to speak with their uh, attorney. Um, that was just uh, a couple nights ago. So do we need, uh, is, assuming this is going to be approved, do we need some discretion on altering that? To from between six months and two years, you provide that to the mayor or something to, to make that edit, or do we have to bring it back? I, I hate to, to guess what they may do. Yeah. Well, so what this says is the, the point of the clawback provision is the Motorola situation where the I mean, we provide the tax abatements, they take the tax abatements, and then they, um, and then they stop doing business, so we didn't receive the benefit that we were negotiating. And, there, and if that's the case, then we, we'd like our money paid back. Is that what your intent was here, Doug? It says right. the developer agrees to repay all the abatements if the developer ceases business, and then we define ceasing business if you're closed for more than six months, and the township for some reason wanted to go out two years or whatever. I mean, six months is, if you close your doors for six months, you're probably out of business, and it's time to pay it back. And, and they agreed to this, right? Yes, sir? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I don't know what the issue is. I don't, uh, uh, Doug, you were there. I, I watched the video. It doesn't appear that they all seem to understand it. Yeah, that's why I said, and uh, um, you know, it, it really doesn't make any sense. I would, I would recommend that you just make a motion to approve this if that's what you're going to do as is, and if it changes, we'll deal with it. We'll bring it back or whatever. I'll move that. Yes, so we'll. Or do we have a motion out there? No. <laughs> we'll, we'll make a motion. Let's get it going. Because I really think, uh, you know, Jess has been one of the. They've been doing this for, we're almost a year on this. Long term businesses that uh, for so many years they never really asked much for the, for the city and that they're looking to expand and uh, I don't necessarily want to say honored exactly, but uh, you should 
be uh, thankful that we have a relationship with a company like that that uh, wishes to keep working with us and expanding here in McKenna. Great. Before I look for a motion, is there anyone, anyone in the public that would like to make a public comment regarding this item? So now I'm looking for a motion to approve uh, 6C as presented. Alderman Glenn? Yeah. Sure. Second by Alderman Devaney. Discussion? See none. Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Glab? Yes. Alderwoman Bainey? Yes. Alderman Santee? Yes. Alderman Schaefer? Yes. Alderman Mahevic? Yes. Alderman Devine? Yes. Alderwoman Miller? Yes. Thank you, Council. Uh, next item on the agenda is discussion uh, items here. We have 7A with CMAP, uh, presentation regarding pavement management evaluation projects. Uh, Troy, you want to go ahead and present this item and kind of get them Thank you. going? Uh, staff presents ARA payment management staff in attendance to present a summary of their findings and recommendations for a city payment management management program. ARA is a research and engineering firm with specific expertise in asset <coughs> management and payment management. The ARA team was consulted by CMET, Chicago Metropolitan Agency of Planning, and City of Henry in summer of 18 to perform a payment conditions survey analysis and create a payment management plan for a future city McHenry payment management operation. So this started last year. Uh, there was a call for applicants to put in for um, a grant to, to run this program, which is payment evaluation, um, payment condition survey, maintenance recommendations, and a future payment management program. Um, Scott Schwede, our street superintendent, was actually the one that secured the grant funding for us successfully. Uh, and they started work uh, around summer, fall of last year. Um, and then what, what this payment management program is, it's, it's a data-driven and asset management-based program for us to maintain our payments. Obviously, the road program and, and funding of the road program has been uh, a topic of, of conversation for, for a long time. And um, asset management is it's basically, like I said, it's, it's numbers-based and it's the future of not just payment management, but kind of public works um, and municipal maintenance programs at large. And uh, it also provides funding recommendations, which uh, will be uh, shown to you shortly. Uh, so with all that being said, I'd like to present ARA, Applied Research Associates, to present to you guys. It's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to the Council. And thank you to all the citizens of the city of McKenna. Uh, we are excited to be here. My name is Joe Stefanski. My colleague, Lance Frank Kumar, is here with us. Um, we both worked on the project, and uh, Jose Rodriguez from CMAP uh, is also here. Um, thank you to Jose. All right. Uh, Troy set up uh, what the program was about, um, pilot pavement management uh, systems. So communities that uh, don't currently have uh, an extensive uh, payment management system uh, could elect to be part of the group. Uh, a year ago, uh, we were appointed to uh, help the city of McHenry with their payment management system. Uh, between then and now, we've had multiple meetings uh, to discuss the project, discuss uh, what, we, what work we had done to date, as well as what we were going to be working on. Um, the city provided, uh, Troy and Scott provided um, extensive information, a questionnaire, um, budget, uh, unit costs for treatments, um, as well as a payment uh, age uh, and segmentation file uh, that we married up with uh, the CMAP um, shape file for the jurisdiction of uh, the city. Made some modifications and uh, um, you can see uh, the map that came part of this uh, project. All right, uh, what are we talking about when we say payment management? Uh, we're trying to use an objective uh, as data-driven as possible uh, procedure to help a community uh, make the decisions on what treatments to do, uh, where to do them, and when to do them. Ideally, we're using a benefit to cost, so we're looking at the benefit of any given treatment uh, to the ratio of its cost, and we're looking at uh, to optimize on that ratio, um, which tends to um, uh, preference not uh, doing a worst uh, first uh, type of procedure, which you know, a lot of times, whatever the worst road is, that's the road we work on. In pavement management, we're trying to reverse that, to inch that in the direction of proactive to keep our good roads, uh, to maintain those good roads in good condition. Um, we collect data, we do a condition assessment, 
uh, to see what is the current condition of the surface. So asphalt, concrete, uh, we do a, a surface condition assessment. We um, calibrate a model, customize a model um, to tell us, like this black line on this graph, to tell us what happens to a pavement segment if we don't work on it. And this is customized, it's calibrated locally, so we're using your seg segments, your um, condition uh, per segment, and the age of that segment. We know the surface age. So we calibrate that, that becomes our network performance deterioration curve. And then, generally speaking, we see that it's not a linear uh, function. It is usually a polynomial, and we see what we like to call is a falling knife um, with that performance over time. And what we see happening here is somewhere in the age of a pavement, there's enough cracking that emerges on the surface that water is getting through those cracks. You can't keep up the crack seal. The water is getting down during the winter, uh, freeze thaw um, is bubbling up those cracks and you're losing the integrity of the layers underneath the surface. So in the first part of a pavement's life, we still have that surface protecting the rock, protecting this subgrade underneath. Uh, somewhere in the middle of its life, uh, we start to deteriorate that base, deteriorate that subgrade. Right before that is when pavement management wants to do a resurface of that road. Typically that's not when we do a resurface of the road. We typically wait until there's more potholes, there's more uh, cracking, and at that point, we're gonna need to do a heavier uh, resurface, a more expensive uh, treatment to that uh, section. And likewise, for pavement preservation, uh, crack sealing, light patching, we want to do that very early in a pavement slide. Most people would say this road doesn't need to be worked on, but we uh, in pavement management have seen if we cover up those cracks before they spider crack, uh, we're going to stop water from infiltrating, maybe prevent the spidering of those cracks for an additional year uh, for a very inexpensive cost. So we calibrate that for payment performance model. We work with the agency to select treatments and put unit costs to those treatments as well as an annual budget uh, with the goal of optimizing uh, the treatment selection and coming up with a five-year capital improvement plan. Uh, we collected the information in October last year. Uh, this is the vehicle we used. Uh, the primary uh, driver of the condition assessment was the laser crack measurement system, LCMS. So we're not using pictures, we're using a laser scanning measurement system off the back of the vehicle. Uh, the lasers are capturing crack location, crack width, depth, uh, and se essentially severity. Um, and uh, we use that in an automated fashion to do the distress survey. Uh, we also have a 360 uh, Google Street View type camera and a traditional uh, profiler off the front that we get ride quality as well as running information that's all in the paper management system. It's an example of the 360. Um, every 20 feet, essentially a Google Street View. Uh, when you wrap yourself around it, you can turn just like Google Street View. Uh, CMAP shows PCI, uh, Pavement Condition Index, for this survey. It's a nationally recognized ACM standard. Um, a very objective uh, process. Uh, and since we're using an automated uh, sampling method, it's 100%. Uh, we can use every frame, quote unquote. Um, this frame down here is, it looks like a picture, but it's actually uh, laser data stitched together. Um, you can see the distresses that are outlined um, and color coded based on the severity of the crack itself. And you can kind of see the purple lines our, our interpretation of where the wheel paths are. And wheel paths are very important because where the wheels go is where we see structural uh, distresses. The distresses that come up, typically come up from the bottom of your uh, pavement, uh, your top of your layer, so your asphalt layer. Uh, when we see those distresses, that's a stronger signal to us of uh, a structural issue with the road. Uh, if cracks are outside of the wheel path, uh, typically climate, uh, weather related, top down cracking, those are easier to take care of. Um, we put all that distress information into a PCI formula and calculate a PCI. Um, and zero, it starts zero up to 100 uh, condition, 100 being the best, zero being the worst. Um, we decided these cutoffs uh, for <coughs> qualitative uh, symbology, but there's nothing official to them. Just some examples of payments. Uh, PCI of 90, we're still not uh, doing much of anything to this in the very good category. <laughs> 
Um, but as soon as we start seeing cracking, this is a 71 and this one is crack sealed. Uh, PCI 71 is well into uh, the category of where we should be crack sealing. You guys are crack sealing, which is great. Um, down here where we hit 52, this is in that fair category. Uh, now we're most likely either at or past the point where we would recommend pavement preservation treatments. So crack sealing, you can't crack seal this enough to keep spider cracks from forming uh, during the year and water getting those cracks in the winter, completely compromising the effects of the crack seal in the first place. Uh, light patching might be able to, you know, if you have isolated areas um, that are contributing to that lower PCI value, you might be able to use some crack seal, but otherwise this is a good candidate for a light, uh, so a thin overlay. And typically these are not the roads that are attended to. Typically we're waiting until a pavement condition gets below that, but in pavement management, we're trying to catch this before we compromise the aggregate, before we compromise the subgrade. Down here, uh, the Baronville uh, PCI 31, most likely we're past the point of being able to uh, remedy everything from within the top layer, within the asphalt layer. Our, our aggregate and our subgrade has been compromised. Um, this is certainly going to need some work down um, lower in the pavement. So this would be a candidate in pavement management where we would say the condition's not horrible yet. It's in poor condition. But there's other roads that could use the, an overlay more. So this would be a category where we would tend to defer uh, road work. So this is where typically the road work begins. We would say in pavement management that overlaying this road is already going to be a thick, thicker overlay with work underneath and we should defer that because waiting two or three years and doing pothole repairs for the next two or three years um, is not going to make that tre uh, treatment three years down the road any more expensive. And then down here at the bottom, PCI, uh, you know, once we get below 20, uh, we need a, a very a thick overlay. We're going to have to work on the base below for sure. Here's the condition assessment. PCI average of right around 50. Uh, this is pretty typical of what we see in agencies. This is not, um, you guys aren't um, off to one side or the other, um, but there are a lot of reds in, uh, on the map. So it's something uh, you know, to address. So we take that condition information and we put it into a pavement management software. Uh, for this uh, project, CMAP chose Micropaper. It's a nationally recognized software. Uh, it's thousand dollars a year for to maintain a license. Um, it's very inexpensive to uh, to use from that standpoint. Um, we put all the condition information, the network information, age information uh, into it. Uh, it's super convenient program to use. And it runs the analysis. So we put the budget in, it runs the analysis and outputs the five year plan. And this is the plan. So five years, this is where the program is looking at uh, spending the money on big projects. This doesn't say whether it's a thin or a thick overlay at this stage, but this is essentially that is a uh, major M in our project. In five years of work. And this, I should say, is using a $2 million a year budget. Also, as a part of that $2 million, we are also um, providing a stop gap, is what it's called in the program, but it's really a safety measure, um, first line tackle of road, road segments that we couldn't fit into a resurface. So we want, as in pavement management, we said this is a good time to resurface this road. We don't have money to do it, so we're going to uh, do a stopgap measure, safety pothole repairs, um, to get it past another year, to get it one more year down the line, until we can put it into the resurfacing bucket. All right, and pavement pres preservation, uh, the best bang for your buck in pavement management. Um, light, crack, uh, light patching, as well as crack sealing, crack sealing patching. Um, this was independent of budget. If you could address maintenance, uh, maintenance uh, activities uh, across your network, where would the program tell you to work? And this is, um, you know, these are the locations. So the purple crack ceiling patching 
greens, cracks happen. So these are pavements in good condition. You can see a lot of pavements in good condition, which is a great problem to have. Um, but the program is you know, essentially telling us keep those pavements in as good condition as possible. Uh, and I don't remember the number, but this is effectively this percentage of your network, you could increase the age, um, you know, the life expectancy of that surface by a year. Uh, and that's a pretty cheap from a unit cost, uh, benefit cost standpoint. All right, we also ran uh, more than just the two million scenario, uh, varying degrees of increased dollars uh, to try to address the backlog as we'll see on the following slides, we do, um, in keeping our good pavements good, we do see an increase in um, you know, those red roads, those poor roads. Um, so we're trying to uh, pick a threshold or pick a target. Uh, if we're at 50 to reach 60, uh, we see a $4 million a year need. So at $2 million a year, uh, this 10-year um, analysis, essentially we're staying pretty level. Um, this is not saying what happens within each category, but it's keeping our average about even. All right, we can see in 10 years with that $2 million a year, um, you see the secret, the, 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 the secret in the sauce, I guess, is that we're taking the very poor and poor roads, and we're trying to uh, remedy them and keep our, uh, with major activities, and we're trying to use light activities to keep our green roads uh, good. And over 10 years, uh, we have increased our good, good roads, so we've maintained that, you know, essentially 50 average, but we can see we still have not remedied the red roads, so our very poor and poor roads, um, we call that an unfunded liability. Uh, we're keeping good roads in good condition, but you know there is a downside. And Two million dollars a year is not enough to get rid of those uh, reds, or at least to reduce those long term. All right, we looked at a scenario that would involve an injection, an injection of additional funding. So five years in, or six years in, I guess, um, what would adding another three million dollars, a one-time bump of three million, is so going from two million to five million, do? We can see that bumps us up to close to that 60 possible target. Uh, and then we just chose 1.7 from out there to year 10. Um, and it starts to drop a little bit. And we can see we do, um, in this solution we have more greens. We still have not gotten rid of our poor and very poor. So that single injection is still not enough to reduce uh, those very poor's. Uh, long term, but we are at least reducing them in, the, in that 10 year term. All right, recommendations from the program. Um, we did no, uh, note that about 50% of the network is in poor or very poor condition, uh, so increased funding would be um, the answer there. Um, maintaining a vigorous <coughs> preservation program, so attacking roads in good condition to keep them in good condition. Uh, updating the pavement management system uh, next year, putting in the work that was actually done this year because it's always going to differ somewhat from uh, what the analysis showed. Uh, and a routine pavement condition survey, we recommend every three to five years doing a uh, reassessment of the surface condition uh, just because the, um, the numbers will diverge over time. They're not as good uh, 20 years out, say. And that's it. Any council members have any questions? Are we going to discuss this uh, later, 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 all of us? Yeah. Okay. Just, just seeing it for the right. first time. Sure. More, the moral of the story is we need at least $2 million a year. Probably <laughs> <laughs> that. Just what I was going to bring up is the fact that the council got to remember uh, we're looking just for this program at $2 million a year, and I don't think it's enough. I don't think. Uh, Proposal that he's got on the table here can't be rectified uh, to where we actually wind up with a, a little bit more aggressive roads down the road. 
thing is, is we've got to do some prior, prior proper planning and we've got to find the revenue that's out there. I know I made a statement back in April as far as uh, and I've been pounding on our state senator to work with Springfield to try and get us more money back uh, for the road money that we paid in the township. Uh, but I think we also, uh, what is it, just recently uh, there's a new uh, gas tax that the state created and the city, I believe, should, what, three cents a gallon was it? Yeah, I think so. That's the amount. I was 19. Now, yeah. what's three cents a gallon that we kind of estimate? Are we talking $100,000 or are we talking half a million dollars? You, you know? mean an additional three cents to the already? Uh, yeah. Correct. Correct. That we can directly go to the right. municipality. I think what Derek was mentioning, the additional 19 cents that was just added. You're talking about an additional three cents. Additional three cents. So it's not part of that state 19. But I, and again, I'm say, saying that oh, that's the only way that we could go, but I mean, we need to look at all the avenues of where we're gonna get the money to work on streets because you showed us some graphs and, and right off the bat, you can see after, what was it, 10 years or whatever, uh, you go through the full cycle, and we're still how many, how many streets behind that were, you know, in <coughs> critical condition. And I think our goal needs to be that after whether it's 10 years, 15, or 20 years out, that we've got most of our streets up to a six or seven at least, and where you're not in dire needs right then and there, to where we get caught up, and then uh, then it's proper maintenance after that. I mean. I've had uh, several discussions with Troy and John before that, uh, as far as the fact that I think uh, Ashley was the uh, street uh, more than anybody uh, ever thought of the fact that they were looking at three quarters of a million dollars. But we wound up putting, just grinding an overlay and keep the water from coming underneath, like you said, but from the sides. Because it's one thing uh, you've got, I don't know if there's more of a Pressed on the streets like the Lincoln Park where there's more, you know, there's no curbing and everything else, but uh, these other areas where we have the curbing, if you don't maintain that concrete, then the water gets down underneath that. And that, that includes the aprons as well, because if it gets underneath the aprons, it's, it's heading downhill and it's getting underneath those roadways. You know, Ashley was a regular roadway approach. And uh, it wasn't until they did some extra investigation because of the fact that we weren't happy with the three quarter million dollar pricing that uh, we found as well. That was the main issue was the water underneath and then, I mean, the concrete hadn't been replaced since uh, the late 60s. So needless to say, a, a lot needed to be done. And it's very costly to do everywhere where you have curbing, but uh, there may be a lot of, you know, are we throwing good money to bad if, uh, if that concrete isn't fixed? But then again, that escalates the cost of doing the street program. Well, we need to look at more more of So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments by council? No? Derek? I, yeah, I just wanted to say um, uh, you know I agree and uh, Alder McLeod and I have had these conversations uh, in seriousness and just through budgets over the last few years about more money for uh, roads and that's always high in our priority. Hopefully council has seen in recent months um, you know, the staff is looking at alternative uh, rather either contracting of services to be able to redirect funds to, to capital projects and, and or capital equipment uh, and looking for alternative sources of revenue uh, to be able to do that and uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, this, this program is nice because it gives us the, the data driven information that we can use to, to, to set a target. I mean, we've, we've had targets that we've identified um, either through our own program or just as a number. Uh, but I think having a, uh, a program like this that we can uh, ref refer to at least for the next five years, if not further beyond that, to be able to say this is what our target is and whether it's two million or three million or three and a half million or whatever that dollar amount is, we need to have that target to reach after from a budget from a CIP, but also more importantly, a budgeting standpoint will be important for us as staff and hopefully use council to and we have some other things that will happen in the next couple of years. Count some council members know, you know, we bonded road projects years ago, and you know, unfortunately, we're still paying bonds on you know, for road improvements. That are, those roads are now probably some of these that are in poor condition. <laughs> and we're 
even if they're, you know, we're still paying for it. So, uh, so we'll be able to redirect some of those, some, all of those funds towards uh, these types of projects too. So we will continue to work on this and, and at least have a target. We can have a discussion with council on this program and how we're gonna utilize it uh, as we move into the CIP uh, program, planning program, so. Yeah, another thing too is, is maybe, uh, might think in the, in the future too is this education <coughs> of the uh, average residents out there. You know, and I've seen probably more of it this year. In fact, Ross and I were just talking about it uh, this morning. And it's the fact that you look at some of these lawns and they're beautifully cut, and then right to the curb. Once you get to the curb, you get weed growth and everything else. Uh, you know, and the problem winds up is, is that weed growth. Yeah, it looks terrible. But it, as it's growing, it's also pushing into uh, between the concrete and the, the surface, and that also breaks up the, the asphalt and, and concrete as well. I mean, you know, nobody can believe it or not, but uh, plant life, if it's growing in between the concrete, will uh, take and slowly erode some of that concrete too. And little education programs like that, and asking our residents to, to jump on the bandwagon uh, down the road, that uh, that might help too. I think, again, we need to look at all different things. I'll go ahead um, Looking at this presentation on page eight, where we have all of the red and the rose, um, I see three green roads in my ward. If we're gonna, if we're gonna fix roads that are at 40, 20 to 40% and leave my ward, not touch for the next five years. Well, my ward, my streets are terrible. Um, I don't know about this. I, uh, I can I understand what you're getting to, but it's just hard to tell the residents that we're gonna fix roads that aren't as bad as yours, and we're gonna let yours go for another five years. That's my problem. Yeah, well, this is where we will probably should have uh, uh, committees of the whole when we're talking about our road programs as far as where the necessities are and everything else. One of the things that uh, when you talk about the roads in Lakeland Park, maybe not every single one of them, but a good percentage of them, and I'll go back to what staff members have told me back 20 plus years ago, and that's the fact that there's so many roads in Lakeland Park because of the underground and everything else that's right. underneath them, you'll never reconstruct them because otherwise it would cost you 10 times at least more than what the average street would be because you're going to be digging out, you know, 8, 10, or even 12 feet of feet underneath. Uh, it could be astronomical for one street uh, to spend two or three million dollars. <coughs> and it's unfortunate that that's the situation, but uh, maybe those need to be looked at better as far as to make sure that we're grinding an overlay on where possible because we don't want to lose those, those streets. Uh, because it doesn't have that good of a base underneath it, and uh, it does need that extra asphalt uh, and care. So. And I think just to clarify too, we, we kind of talked about it staff-wise, is the goal would not be, or the program would not be just to ignore those that are poor and poor or very poor condition, uh, but to make sure that we you know, address those that are in the, in the worst case condition as part of a hybrid program, and that's Troy's terminology, where, where we you know look at how funding can best be utilized to maintain, you know, make sure that the streets that are in better condition are, we get the most life out of, with an understanding that there's some really poor, or very poor streets in town that, that while some of them we can not address further out or push off or defer, that there's some that we just have to deal with and we know that. So, so it would be more, I think it, we agree it would be more of a hybrid program, not just totally writing off those streets that are in the red, just, you know. If I may chime in, that is, that is something that we have a concern about as far as um, just as you, as you mentioned, the perception from, from residents that, that their particular street or neighborhood is being ignored, that that would not be the intention we would, we would want. But we would want to strongly consider the recommendations of this program and that we may be looking at some approaches and some treatments that would be unorthodox in comparison to what we did in the past. In the past, all we ever did was just our very worst roads, these are our very worst roads and we're gonna do all of our very worst roads. Um, what the numbers of this program and, and, and sort of data analytics is, is 
revolutionizing the public works uh, municipal maintenance industry, so to speak. And the, the data-driven approach doesn't necessarily point you towards, towards doing the worst roads first. Um, we, would, we would want to make some different decisions in comparison to the past while still considering uh, the individual neighborhoods and streets and residents and, and still try and pluck off those very worst um, just maybe at, at more of a controlled pace that we can still optimize our overall system rate. I'll move on. Yeah, I was going to just state that, uh, you know, I understand the, the different type of philosophy now that we had in the past. However, uh, when you start looking at these roads and what needs to be done, I think one thing that needs to be looked at, and that's the fact that you do have subdivisions that are, let's say, less than 20 years old, some of them, and already we're looking at uh, street repairs and possibly grinding overlay in some of them. In fact, we had the major part of uh, Dartmoor on the other, on the west side of the bridge that we had to repay. Um, but you do have neighborhoods that people have lived there for 30 or more years that haven't seen anything done to their streets and they're starting to deteriorate. And how do you tell those, uh, those residents that, well, the newer areas, uh, whether the materials weren't as good or the labor wasn't as good or whatever, and they're de deteriorating more than, than theirs, how do you tell them that they gotta wait another 10 years or another eight years? <coughs> so all I'm saying is, is, I'm not saying that's how we determine the criteria, but I think we need to keep that in the back of our minds also when we make these decisions. Well, yeah, and I, yeah, where's the justifications? And I, I, think, I think you can find that one of our goals is also to create this create this capital to put towards our system, and, and as we do that, that a lot of these durations of having to wait make it shorter in their own right by, by us um, pushing towards freeing up capital, creating capital to push towards our program. And needless to say, the perfect solution is find the money to do it. Seven years, we can be caught up with everything, right? <laughs> So I think that's our one of our bigger goals is let's find some money to, to get some more aggressive street programs done and, and we won't have to spend quite as much time discussing what needs to be done and what doesn't and maybe discuss more of how well it looks and how do we keep it that way. That's all. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Hey guys, appreciate it. Next item on the agenda is 7B is uh, regarding the discussion of vaping and tobacco license moratorium. Chief Burke. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on February 18th, Council had an open discussion in regards to the risks associated with vaping and vape shops in the city limits of McHenry. That discussion resulted, to, uh, resulted in a unanimous vote by Council to uh, institute a vaping moratorium at the March 18th. Uh, city Council meeting that took effect immediately and expired on December 31st of 2019, um, giving staff time to start to do a little bit of research on what action could be taken in, in regards to the risks associated with vaping. Um, we're back here tonight in front of Council to try to get some input from Council on what action they would like us to take. Um, staff has met, uh, myself and the Director of Economic Development and Community Development, um, we've done our own uh, research um, and we're looking for some discussion with council and some direction from them um, specific to uh, vape shops as, as a type of business um, and the restrictions potentially associated with those specific businesses um, and or a combination of restrictions in the tobacco licensing section of our ordinance that would regulate the amount of licenses that would potentially allow vaping devices and uh, accessories to be sold within the city of McHenry. Uh, right now, if you have a tobacco license, uh, you can sell vaping, uh, vaping de devices and accessories, uh, whether or not it's a gas station, or a grocery <coughs> store, or a uh, liquor store, um, or a vape shop. And so we're looking to get some direction from council on whether or not they want us to proceed under the avenue of further regulating vape shops as a business or uh, vaping, the sale of vaping devices and accessories. <coughs> Thank you, Chief. 
Uh, open up for discussion by council. Does anyone have any input, comments, questions? I'll just say I'm absolutely in favor of continuing and even looking at further restrictions. I mean, it's just every time you turn on the TV or you're watching the news, it's really so dangerous and being so abused by high school and junior high kids, you know, in our community, which is pretty unfortunate. Any other comments? Alvin Glenn? Yeah, I mean, I think more than anything else is Vape shops, I can see where we you know want to curtail that. I don't know about tobacco shops, uh, doesn't seem like that's been an issue. The vape shop seems to be the big thing. Uh, and the thing is about uh, vaping is the fact that uh, you know there's less and less knowledge about what it'll do to you as much as tobacco. You know, tobacco we were talking before I even started smoking 50 years ago. Um, so there's so much to learn, and um, it's interesting that the mayor brought this up uh, what, back in January. I never really thought much of it, and then all of a sudden, you know, you start looking here and there, and guess what? You start seeing the big shops. And maybe we caught it before it really gets to be, you know, that much of a presence. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, Chief, uh, what do you you feel as far as uh, Yes, uh, we want to curtail how many vape shops, uh, and maybe what we already got it might be enough. But uh, what are you proposing that we have a, a license like we do with uh, liquor and uh, and gaming? Uh, well, well, we do. So just taking a step back is is we did do some research. We looked at some other municipalities. Huntley was the more recent one that made some changes um, for the same reason. Um, they created a. Uh, a zoning classification. The first they defined what a vape shop was, and then they created a zoning classification for it, um, which regulated where uh, where those shops could potentially open up in, in within their community, um, which in, in essence regulated the amount of vape shops by definition that could open up in their community. They also made changes to their tobacco license ordinance, which further restricts the type of businesses that are eligible to apply and obtain tobacco license that would sell vaping equipment and accessories. Um, and so those are our, those are realistically, those are the two ways that staff can, can address the issue on the vaping moratorium. Because right now, the vaping moratorium resulted in a freeze of tobacco licenses. That's how we, that's really what the moratorium ended up being. When Attorney McCarl drafted it is, we have not issued, we, we should have not issued any licenses effective March 18th. Um, and we, we do have businesses in town that are interested in applying at this point, but we have not issued any. Paul and Schaefer? Um, I agree with what you just said, too, that it's got to take into account those other locations that can also sell it, sell those items. And the one other thing that I would add that, that if you could research, it's called a vape shop. It's, it's available now at some county area uh, bars and restaurants and it's actually taking, it's actually taking an alcohol and vaporizing it as a shot and it gets into your bloodstream and your brain much faster it's very uh, it's actually in um, a bar in Woodstock um, my daughter told me about it and I think that should be definitely included somehow in this that that would not be we can address that most likely. But I would definitely yeah, research it. It's, it's, not, it's not anything new. It's been out there for a couple of years and it's, um, it's, in a, it's, it's, it's popular because of the fact that it, it gets into your bloodstream much, much faster than just doing a regular <coughs> liquid shot. But it's, it's, there's companies selling that equipment all over. So, and I don't think we have any restrictions on, on any in our liquor license that that would say you couldn't get those. I'll definitely look into that. Wow. The, uh, I was going to say, you know what, I, I never heard that before, but you brought up a good point and that's the fact that's something we should act on right away as far as the fact that we get a amended uh, to, uh, liquor license uh, ordinance basically to where it's poor and in a liquid form or whatever. It's, it's just amazing how many ordinances you got to create 
boom, because somebody comes up with something new and ingenious that and then yeah, is harmful on a to, basis to the regular right. residents. Um, some of the conversations that, that Doug and, and, and I have had um, along with Ross was, um, you know, from the enforcement aspect, from law enforcement, you know, it, we will, we have already started taking an aggressive stance on compliance checks within the businesses that are allowed to sell these products. Again, the, the law that changed with the ordinance provision that you passed earlier tonight restricts that sale to 21 and under now, um, which will help, I believe, you know, the safety and the risk factors that we've been we've been trying to address within the community, um, along with compliance checks to make sure that people are only selling to people under the age uh, or over the age of 21. Um, but the uh, the further regulation in the tobacco licensing side of the ordinance. Um, could place some restrictions on potential future businesses that would potentially want to move into town too. We've had, councils had discussions on uh, gas stations and truck stops and other types of businesses that have wanted to move into town to uh, establish a business in town, but obviously wanted a liquor license. And if we further restricted the types of tobacco licenses, that could also affect economic growth. Uh, comments, questions? Oh, Just many. to clarify, um, Chief, are you saying that there's businesses that say we had further restrictions on vaping, or maybe a gas station can sell tobacco and we consider vape products to be nicotine and maybe separate them in a different Which, license that they would be less likely to come into town? They, well, they would. I mean, we council's already considered opening up two speedways and a, and a, and a Thornton's uh, coming up, and I will tell you this, uh, vaping, devices and accessories are extremely popular for retail sale in a lot of these uh, shop and go type atmospheres, whether it's gas stations or liquor stores. Um, they're, they're sold on a fairly regular basis. What, what the percentage of their income revenue is off of that, I, I would be just guessing, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a large percent. I mean, if it were alcohol, definitely. I don't, I don't know about the vaping and the smoking and the tobacco, but it, I mean, if you go into any gas station, you can see. Is that would, that's how we would probably tackle it. David and I have talked a couple times. If, if we were gonna go at it from the, or, the the tobacco licensing side, we would basically, we have one classification of tobacco license right now. Um, and uh, with the revisions that we did tonight, you know, Ross would be responsible for approving those licenses uh, as they're applied for, but we would end up at creating more than one classification of the license. So that way we could separate potentially what vaping would look like, so that we would be able to enforce those restrictions on traditional tobacco products versus vaping products, and that would be an enforcement issue, right? One hundred percent. We would have to. There's. I mean, there's compliance checks would be all. We would have to do them right away. And right now we have to. But we've <coughs> we've, just, we've just done our first tobacco compliance check for vaping specifically this year, um, and that's exactly what we targeted sell vaping devices and accessories. Is it your opinion that there would be less, if you want to call it a public risk, you know, with kids getting it from gas stations? But I mean, just in a scenario that the only place you could get the vaping materials was in a vape shop, might possibly make it a little more restrictive because maybe you wouldn't have an 18 or 16 year old walking in that shop versus going into Walgreens or a gas station that's on the corner. I just, I mean, what's your opinion on how The more locations, the, the better the chances are for some non-compliance issues. Um, uh, you know, I, I think by addressing the issues with the vape shops through, uh, through zoning, that that's a way for council to, because there were, I looked back through the meeting minutes when we talked about this in February and in March, there was some concern over where these vape shops go up in town and what, what the future looked like for McHenry as far as business growth by council, and so I think that's a separate related topic from health and safety type of issues, but that was part of the discussion. So I think the zoning part addresses that. Um, I think the under 21 change to the state law will help us, along with our compliance checks, to enforce our youth using vaping devices, and I, I think that if we re further restrict tobacco licenses with vaping, they're just gonna drive to Wisconsin and buy it anyways, because it's so close, because the age is 18, How many tobacco licenses do you currently have issued? That's a Ross question. 
I'll get that for you. Hold on. I just actually had it. And then while Ross is figuring out that question, um, when he gets the answer, when you did your research, do we have a similar number based on population as other communities of our same size? Do we have more or less? Did you find any history or I don't I don't think that, that none of us I don't think at this point none of us have compared ourselves to other communities as far as the amount of tobacco licenses. The, you know, you get a state tobacco license in addition to a local tobacco license. So prior to the changes you approved tonight, the approval process was uh, was very non regulated for the most part. It's very informal on a local we charged twenty five dollars for a tobacco license for anybody who wanted to sell tobacco and the approval process was uh, next to almost non-existent until you guys just approve that during the consent agenda. So now the license goes up to two hundred fifty dollars, and there is an actual approval process that you know that that Ross can go through to make sure that the right type of business is actually applying for a tobacco license. And we've never had that in our ordinance before. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. That includes every. Gas station, grocery store, liquor store, liquor store they, they, they all sell tobacco products. So. Any other questions? Comments? What about direction? All of a Yeah, I can saw from listening to everything. It, are we, one of the options, or maybe one of the major options here, is, is looking at a a license and tobacco, but maybe different levels of a tobacco license? So one of the options would be to say we have a type one tobacco license, which is traditional cigarettes and chewing tobacco. We had a type two tobacco license, which would be just vaping uh, devices and accessories. And then a type three, which would be say a combination of both um, as a way to regulate it. And then obviously the, the other option would be to change implement some kind of a zoning uh, amendment uh -huh. to regulate where vape shops, to find a vape shop, what it is, what a definition in the ordinance, and then define the zoning classification. There, there would be no reason to classify them as three if you don't zone it. I mean, there's, what's the point, right, of separating? Correct. So right now, what are you going to do with the ones that are in the zone already? In, in essence, what Huntley did was they, they changed their zoning which actually took four of, I think, four of the five vape shops that they had, made them non-compliant, immediately, effective immediately. They took those back to council for uh, considerations for a variance, and which I'm sure that they will give. They've already worked out those details, would be my assumption. Um, but then in, in essence, it, it, it basically, it, in essence, strictly re restricted Stop. any future vape shops from coming into town. And just to follow up that is then a vape shop closes down then because of a special conditional use that we could take it back and could stop. If we did something like that, it would be non-compliant at that point. Well, correct? It would be non-conforming. Non so right. So you then falls within the non-conforming provisions and it will maintain that license until the place burns down or you amortize it over, say, five years and you put a time limit on it or some other non-conforming provision, you know, they stop doing business and it's abandoned. Otherwise, it's not, it's legal and non-conforming until it <coughs> ceases business, right. right? Until whatever, right? There's several options. Yeah, yeah. And then we, you know, like if there's no tattoo right? If right. they yeah. close their doors, can't we yeah. just right. they they close tattoo. their doors, yeah. then they, you would not be able to be open. Then they lose Wasn't that one year? They'd have to be in, it was one year, isn't that what we have right now? Yeah. Tattoo powers. What about David? Can you just prohibit prohibit the use? Uh, that would be considered a risk of an administrative taking, condemning it. I, but not the ones we have. For new? No. We were right. That's what Huntley did. Yeah. The, for the new going forward, it stopped it. For the ones that exist, they're not conforming. Or are they get a variance. Yeah. <coughs> Where's everyone else at? So I guess I'm hearing two issues. I'm hearing a licensing issue 
and then a standalone vape shop issue. Um, that we, we literally are talking about two different things. And right. I, pardon? Correct. Right. Yeah. So I think we need to handle them separately, um, personally, because the licensing to me is is going to impact future business development and growth as businesses come in and they're seeking those licenses. A vape shop, you know, we can control that through zoning and through, you know, directing them to certain areas of town, which may or may not provide an opportunity. Um, so I think we need to, in discussion, we need to talk about them separately because to me they're two separate issues. One's about a license for an existing business that does that in part of their business and the other, the big shop, is that's the standalone only business part. Um, so that's just my thoughts. Any others? Yeah. Yeah, and just to, to build on, um, on that, I, I would agree. I think that uh, from from my perspective is that by addressing a, a zoning issue to let's let's tackle the vape shops, which was the primary discussion that council had um, back in February, and then when they uh, adopted the moratorium in March, and if we work together to do some kind of a, a zoning amendment to that, and we will work with the existing shops, that tackles that issue. And I, I would honestly say that because of the changes that the state and we have now made in our local ordinance reference, the age of the sale of vaping, um, along with uh, our, our compliance enforcement that we, we've stepped up that let's let those two changes play out on the other side, on the safety side or the, the health risk side that we've also been examining reference vaping. Because again, if we, the, what we can control on the sale of vaping is we can control the underage use or consumption or purchase of it. And, but we cannot control the over 21 consumption or purchase of it in, in, or, or the use of it in our community necessarily. Um, so by separating those tobacco licenses at this time, I don't know if that would be an effective method at this point. Well, you took a turn there. So are we going to do the vape only in a zoning district? Yeah, we, we can work something out with that. Okay. So that, that would be our recommendation okay. for the, the, for the first okay. step. And then the so fact that the state changed the law right. combined with the fact that you know you can't you can't buy it. Many of our businesses in town, unless you're 21 or older. Now. So that, that affects, that directly makes an impact, a positive impact on all the issues we've had with our kids in our high school trying to buy it and stuff like that. So now, and then we combine that with our compliance checks, the police department going out and doing our undercover operations at all the locations that sell to make sure they're abiding by that 21 and over. We're now making a positive impact in our community about the safety issues associated with our youth and, and vaping. Um, but the over 21, I don't know what impact you're making if you further restrict the sale of vaping in McHenry, but it's allowed in all the collar communities that you're just going to drive so a half a mile outside our community, still buy that vacant dice and still come back to McHenry. We'll probably be having this exact same discussion about marijuana in the same way. We are going to have a long discussion about marijuana. <laughs> because, <laughs> but it's the same issue. It, it, it's the type of material that's going to be sold with tobacco, alone, or in combination. That either alone, a standalone store, or a combination with other products. No, it'll it'll be a standalone store. Right. So, nice, the, so nice like, the zoning districts, you might as well, you know, they're probably going to go together. I guess I don't know what zoning district you're going to put vaping in, but it's probably going to have the same type of analysis. So, having said that, Doug, have you guys talked at all at P and Z about cannabis? No, we have not. So the IML is coming out with an ordinance relatively soon, as well as our some associations. We should have something I would say in the next month to at least start looking at to see how other <coughs> associations and, and government groups are going to handle it. We shouldn't have to recreate the wheel too much. Alderman Schaefer, um, on the enforcement side, what is the is the par department involved when? the schools, are you called by the schools when they find somebody with underage vaping? Yes. Is there a ticket, a violation, a fine, what happens? Yeah, and we just updated all that when you guys approved the amendment. So the fines went up, they go to adjudication court here. 
um, because it's a local ordinance violation. We could write it under the state statute to send it to the courthouse if we wanted to. Um, but the fines, the, we decreased the fine amounts here. Um, our SROs handle that issue in high schools, and our patrol officers handle those issues in all grade schools. And we do have, we do see it somewhat regularly, and that's why that change in the over 21 for the sale is going to help us along with our compliance. We've been, we'll run another compliance check here very shortly to see where we're at. We only had one violation um, in the town and when we did our compliance checks. We specifically, based on intelligence, we looked at specific locations in towns, specific businesses that sell vaping devices, and we checked numerous ones, and we only had one, one of those locations that sold to an underage uh, person. <coughs> so that's good. That means, that again, that tells us that you know our businesses in town are at least acting responsible and following the rules um, that are applied to them when they do have a license to sell vaping and stuff. So. Yeah, because you're not going to be able to control online purchases, yes. which is yeah. huge. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering, too, from a school standpoint, if we if, do they do anything with you guys from a uh, education standpoint or a you know uh, a violation standpoint, so that the students are aware of what those are. Do, they, do you know of any of that in the schools? Well, you we've done like in there. I'm sure there's probably something maybe not in their handbook because it's come on so quickly, so fast. But you know things like that. Is there anything that the schools can help us with in this situation, other than just sending it to you guys when there's a violation that they find? Well, we, they provide us as much intelligence in both, especially in the high schools, as we can get. But we've taken that a step further this year. We've had a, we had an open meeting at West Campus and invited all the parents. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've openly talked to them exactly about what we've been tracking the statistics now for, for probably the last, well, since the end of the last school year and then the start of this school year especially. So we had the first half of the school year under. So we had all the statistics of, you know, how many kids have at least tried vaping how many have been cited and how the ones that were vaping, how many of them actually had um, you know, THC in their vaping devices and not nicotine. So we were able to present that to the parents as trying as our first step effort to try to make an impact on impact on educating the parents that you know we, we needed them to get involved too with helping to regulate this because it's it is not a harmless um, habit by any means. Thank you. Alright. Good. So we will come back with a zoning recommendation and with whatever process Doug's gonna go through for that to, right? Yeah, we'll actually we'll present it to them as a draft and then send it to zoning. Okay, yeah. perfect, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the executive session. We are not gonna have that this evening. Uh, any staff reports? Uh, Mr. Hobson. Mm -hmm. Little thing called yesterday's going on right now. If the parade is Sunday, if you're interested in being in that parade, just please let me know so I can uh, let the chamber know and save a spot so that everybody's accounted for. And I'll go line up for everything before. The lineup usually starts at noon. You can get there, you can get there a little earlier than that if you want, but uh, elected officials will all be on Main Street just like usual. Parade steps off at like 1 30. It will be hot, yes, it will be hot. <laughs> but so far, everything, uh, everything's been going great. Uh, tonight was our big wheel race, and I didn't hear any results from that yet, but uh, it was a good weekend overall, and um, no major incidents that I was made aware of. That's it, any other staff reports? I have uh, mayors passing down uh, from our first strategic planning session Marcy Picos got the, the draft of the summary report of that. I will also email this to you tomorrow, but I wanted to hand it out tonight. And uh, take a look at this. There's, uh, I'll have some instructions for you in the email tomorrow. Uh, the next step of this, as we discussed at the end of the first strategic planning session, is to ourselves or you as individuals or us as individuals uh, start to look at some actionable goals to, to uh, meet some of the address some of the items that we identified and then come back together as a group in a second session. And what I want, uh, would like some feedback from council on tonight is if you have your calendars with you, is what you'd like to do for a second session. 
Um, we could try an off one day in August, which would be the 12th through the 26th. Um, the council meeting nights are the 5th and the 19th, uh, or we could look out into September. There's actually five, uh, five Mondays in September. We only have, we have a council meeting on a Tuesday, the first one in September, because of Labor Day. Uh, so we can look at something like that too. Does is, is council have any thoughts on either the 12th or the 26th of August? I know it's vacation time too, so it's tough. September, 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 the one, just one other thing, and just to, uh, Tony Esposito has touched on it early on, but the construction at Miller Point, if you haven't been down there, it's, it's actually progressing really well. We're hoping by this weekend all the brick pavers will be laid as well as the gazebo up. Um, that's, it's, the structure for the gazebo is up, the roof is, is mostly on, um, and most of the brick pavers are already down. We did get hit by some Canadian geese, so we're going to be dealing with that issue. Uh, just to make sure that we can get it all cleaned up and try to create some deterrent down there on the sidewalk. But it looks really good if you haven't been down there. The last thing we will be waiting on uh, is light poles that are just on back order. But uh, the pavilion itself has turned out really nice. So hopefully this weekend we'll see it and it's pretty close to completed form. Thank you. Uh, going on to Mayor's report, uh, I just wanted to uh, some of you probably know, but Ben Keith from VFW had approached me that there has been a majority support um, in regards to extending uh, the VFW Queen of Hearts. Uh, so I wanted to approach all of you and see if that support is there. And if that is, uh, we'd have to have to, we would have to have a special meeting by next Monday in order to get this passed for them to move forward in order to, for them to continue the game, but also extend it to the end of August. Um, so just by conversation, we can have a discussion on it if you'd like. Um, I know who the four are, but I want to mention that publicly, so if you'd like to speak up, if you are in support of that, uh, we would need a majority to make this meeting. Uh, so those supporters, I would hope, would be able to make the meeting and then um, move forward with that. And, so. we're, and we're probably looking, I mean, right now, that, that means earliest would be Wednesday because when well not really because we're already within the 48 hour time frame for Wednesday so it would have to be Thursday so we'd have to have that in a special meeting. It would be this this Thursday. And you can meet anytime. You can do it five in the afternoon or whatever. Whoever's available. When is the uh, presentation this Thursday night? It starts at 5 o'clock. It does. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, this, there's, some, there's just party at Smith's Garage that might, I don't know if that starts at 5 or a little bit earlier. That's at 5 o'clock. That starts at 5 and then it goes over to the park after that. I think we do some before 5 o'clock. Yeah. Well, you know, in the majority then, right? I do not. Any other? I'll just finish up on, yes, I, I'm, I'm I'm interested in allowing them to continue through August. Um, I could make myself available for a, um, a four o'clock Thursday, or the latest day we could do would be Monday. Is that what you said? Right, yeah. And, you know, I would make myself available for, you know, it would have to be like a six o'clock or uh, whatever is uh, convenient for uh, uh, a majority or, or a group of our of council. Yeah, Thursday or Monday would work for me, and yes, I would be in favor of opening up the door to rediscuss it. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll go on another. Um, I think, Ben, you guys have done a great job in uh, parking lot and traffic control. Um, that makes me feel real good about looking forward to extending that because the issues that we had for the year and a half long game aren't there anymore. So I would certainly make myself available and look forward to giving that extension. Thank you. I could do um, Thursday or Monday, Thursday at 4 o'clock. Okay. Same here. So no, Thursday, 4 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Good. Perfect. All right.
there's a first question. Thank you. Uh, any city council comments? Alderman Schaefer? Um, could we get an update on um, any and all uh, gravel pit complaints that have happened since we made the decisions that we made, either from that came in here or came to them? Because we're supposed to be tracking those, correct? Yeah. Official and unofficial? Yeah. I'd just like it. to hear how that stuff's going. Yeah, I'll send an update out this week. That would be great. Thank you. Anyone else? Alderman Santi? Um, I, just a, an observation. Uh, two observations. The, the the Queen of Hearts seems to be going very smoothly on Tuesdays. I've been there in attendance just to watch the ticket being pulled. And um, when I walk in at about 7 o'clock, um, I, I don't know, I see about 20 to 25 percent of the parking slots still available. And it seemed to be pretty, it seemed to be close to capacity, but comfortable inside. And uh, it seems to be running very efficiently. And the second item I had was, was, was last Thursday night, it was something new, something very unique. I, Chamber's not here, but I mean, of course, City uh, did a tremendous job of helping set up and everything too. But that presentation Thursday night was fantastic. And you know what? They had perfect weather. That was a night that it was a little bit cooler. So it was very comfortable out there. And um, it was two, three hundred and three hundred. Yeah. And, and just, a, just a very nice presentation. And I don't, I don't want to take anything from Paul Wu and Baby, but you may have a couple comments on it too, but it was great. Well, I, thought it was, I thought it was great too. <coughs> I was there, it was good, it was awesome. It was, yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it at green. Yeah, that was good. Any other city council comments? <coughs> See none, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. I'll go on Danny. Seconded by Alderman Santi. I'll second. Please call the roll. Alderwoman Bainey? Yes. Alderman Sandy? Yes. Alderman Glapp? Yes. Alderman Schaefer? Yes. Alderman Mehevick? Yes. Alderman Devine? Yes. Alderwoman Miller? Have a good evening.